Hey church, I hope you're having a great summer and enjoying Summer Blast. Each week I've invited a different speaker to share a message God has put on their hearts. Today you will hear from Elias Herrera. Elias has been attending Love of Christ Church for six years and has been an active part of serving on our dream team in leading worship and small groups. He currently oversees our Middletown student ministry and serves on the Middletown worship team. I am so looking forward to seeing Elias' passion for God's Word come forth today. Join me in welcoming Elias Herrera. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone feeling? That's good. That's good. It's great to be in the house of God this morning. Uh, it is great to see some familiar faces and uh, some not so familiar faces too. It's been a little bit since I've been here, uh, but I'm just so happy to be here. And I was a little nervous coming uh, coming in here. I got to be honest with you, but after, I mean, shame on me. It's like I, nothing's going to go right unless I speak every word perfectly, right? Like the Holy Spirit's already been working today in this place before we even got here. He's been working. So I just praise God for that, and I'm so happy for that. Um, I'm also happy that I am not in charge of production here because it's a hard job, and Lord knows that the feed would not get to Middletown or online. So let's just welcome all those who are watching online and on Middletown, whether you're on vacation or you're at home or wherever. We welcome you, and we're so uh, glad that you are here today. And I want to also express uh, how grateful I am for this opportunity to speak uh, to you uh, what God has placed on my heart today. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge my wife this morning. I'm here with my beautiful wife here in the front. Her name is Colleen. Uh, she is my beautiful bride, and um, uh, I love her. And uh, <laughs> and next month, we will actually be celebrating our two-year anniversary. Isn't that great? That is awesome. You know, two years into this marriage thing, and you know, I'm kind of a pro. Uh, no, I'm kidding. There's, there's so much to learn about marriage, and I am so excited to do marriage with her and to go about life with her. And um, in order to uh, kind of go about what, I'm, what God has placed on my heart, I have to talk about her just for a little bit. Is that okay if I brag about my wife for a little bit? I'm just going to do that real quick. And, um, you know, her and I go way back, going on 10 years now, and... Um, you know, she's been there. We, we started off as friends. Believe it or not, she didn't fall for me immediately. It's crazy, I know. Uh, it took some time. It was like four years. We were friends. We had been, uh, you know, friends for a long time. We were in textiles and clothing class. I was the only male in a sewing class, believe it or not. Uh, but I was also co-captain of the football team. So it, was, it wasn't, I was still tough. You know what I mean? And so we were really good friends. And um, we kind of hit it off immediately. Like I said, four years of friendship. We started dating. The rest is history. Now we're about to celebrate two years, like you know. And, you know, she's just so great. She's, she's funny. She's intelligent. She's so beautiful. Uh, she's my favorite woman on planet Earth. And, uh, you know, she, she, she keeps me grounded, if you know what I mean. Not like in the, in the sense like if you know me, you know that I'm not very administrative. You know, I can, I can do admin stuff, but it's not my strong suit. Okay, if you know me, you know that. But that is her strong suit. Like that is one of her gifting. She's so good at administration stuff. So anytime I kind of think like I know what I'm doing, she's really good at bringing me down. I mean, like not really down. I mean, like where I should be to begin with. You know what I'm saying? Then she's so good at that. And like, I wouldn't be where I'm at today without her. And God has blessed me. And the word says that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And I found my good thing. Thanks to God. Amen. Amen. But if I could just say one bad thing. Can I say one? I'm going to tell him, babe. Can I tell him? I'm going to do it. As good as a wife she is, and she's amazing, I'm telling you. She's awesome. You ask her, she'll tell you. She's a great wife. As good as a wife she is, she makes a horrible, terrible, I'm talking terrible, God. She's so bad at being God. Like, I can't even, I can't even articulate, I can't help you understand how bad of a God she is. I mean, you should see it. Sometimes when we have disagreements, it takes her up to four minutes to, to get on my good side again. You should see it. I mean, sometimes we say things that we don't mean. She hurts my feelings sometimes. Great wife, great person, horrible, horrible God. 
And you know, when we got married, I'm gonna put a pin in that. We got married and we, um, we had to figure out our living arrangements. Where were we gonna live, right? We got married, great, here comes the bride, blah, blah, blah. Everything's great, now where are we gonna live, right? So we had this side over here saying, you better rent, you gotta rent to learn how you guys, uh, your, your quirks and, and how you handle finances. You gotta learn, you know, before you invest in a house, rent first. And then you got this side over here, it's like, you better not rent, rent, throw money. That's how they sound, by the way. You better not rent because you're throwing money down a rat hole and that's not good. And then so needless to say, my wife and I had to pray about this. We had to uh, seek the Lord. We had to look at our current situation and make this decision on our own. So we actually ended up purchasing a house right out of marriage. So we were fortunate enough, we were blessed enough to purchase our own house. And you should see, I mean, I was like, I'm driving in my driveway, I'm par putting my car in park, and I'm going in my house and I, I see like a bush is growing a little too bushy and, and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna trim this bush because this is my bush. You know what I mean? This is my house. Pride of ownership kicks in. You know what I'm saying? And I go in the back and I see that my deck is full of leaves. You know what? I'm gonna stop what I'm doing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push these, I'm gonna rake these leaves out of the way. I'm gonna brush them out the way because this is my deck. This is my house. Pride of ownership kicks in. But as good as an investment my house was, our house was, and as good as it is, it was really cool. I mean, I, I liked our house. It makes a terrible, terrible God. Like, horrible. I mean, you should see, one time at 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke up after, like, this torrential downpour, and I go to the basement, and it's flooded. I mean, the whole basement, not even just a little bit of water. I'm talking about a flood. You know what I mean? Like, I was, you know, hashtag Noah's Ark kind of thing. Like, it was flooded. And, and so, as good as an investment the house was, and as great as it was, it makes a terrible God. Now, after marriage, you know, my wife had, she was driving a two-wheel drive vehicle, and um, she had had a situation back, I think, in high school where she was, uh, it, it was, there was a lot of rain and a lot of ice, and, and she, had, she was pulled over to the side. She couldn't get out of this kind of hole, and she needed an all-wheel drive vehicle to kind of get her out. So, you know what I did being the good husband I am? I was like, you know what, baby, we got to get you an all-wheel drive vehicle. Because I had an all-wheel drive vehicle. It's not fair that I have one and she doesn't. So we traded in her car and we got this all-wheel drive vehicle, right? You should see this thing, 40 miles per gallon. It's got the dynamic radar cruise control. It's got the lane keep assist. It's got all-wheel drive. It's amazing. But as good as the car is, it also makes for a terrible, terrible, horrible God. Now, you should see this thing, it's nice, but there was one time Colleen was driving and she was driving behind this truck, and of course this pebble, it was like as if it were on a mission, it got off of this truck and went directly on her wind, windshield, and get, you already know what happens, it cracked. It cracked, so, I mean, and guess what? We're still paying for the thing. I mean, I wake up, the money's out of my, they don't even ask me. It just comes out of my account. I'm sure sometime I signed a waiver or something. but. They just take the money. It's a great car, it's, it's really peppy, it's all wood drive, it's safe and everything, but it makes a terrible, terrible God. Why do I say all these things? Why do I bring all these things up? Why have I not revealed the title of my sermon yet? Why? It's because all of these things have one common denominator. They're great things. Marriage is good, I mean, I love it. Uh, owning a house is good. Buying a nice car is good but they, the common denominator is that they are horrible gods. And I'll submit to you today that none of those things were ever created to be my God, ever. And so the main idea that the Lord has placed on my heart today to share with you this morning is in Christ alone. Can you say that with me? In Christ alone. Fun fact, that is my favorite hymn. Probably, I know it's crazy, probably my favorite song of all time. When they were singing it, I, I was trying not to sing because the more I sing, the more I start weeping. I love the song so much. But it is my favorite song. And today, I'm going to be preaching the gospel to you. And thank God you're at a church where the gospel is preached every single Sunday from this very spot. Amen? That is, that is amazing, by the way. Okay, we're at a church where the gospel is preached, and it's not going to change today. I'm going to be preaching the gospel. If you've never heard the gospel before, this message is for you. If you have heard the gospel, this message is also for you. And we're gonna kick things off with the first point today, seek life. By fixing our eyes on the carnal things, we reap a carnal outcome, an empty outcome, a limited outcome, if you will. Now by fixing our eyes on the only one who could give us life, we obtain overall enjoyment, satisfaction, 
and life itself, amen? Now, your wife, your husband, children, entertainment, social movements, trends, all of these things are actually not bad things. They're good things in itself. But it's when we elevate them to a point of supremacy that it begins to be a problem. Because those things will always let us down. Like I was already explaining, my wife can sometimes let me down. My house will let me down. My car. These things were never meant to be perfect and, and give me ultimate life and ultimate meaning. It is impossible to experience overall life from limited sources. Now, let's go to our first verse. A little bit of context before we get to our first verse, which is in Luke chapter 24, verse one. Um, Jesus has been dead for three days, and everybody is upset. His followers are weeping. They're really, you know, kind of, they're, they're bummed out because the person that they had been uh, interacting with, learning from, talking with, eating with, all this sort of thing, he was dead for three, for three days at this point. Now, at this very point, the women were going to tend to the tomb, and here's where we are in this verse. It says, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. Now, this particular passage, I gotta be honest, when I first read it, it rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. I'm gonna explain, explain why. So Jesus, Jesus, the Messiah, right? He had been... He had been eating with his disciples and his followers. He had been uh, performing miracles uh, with his followers. He had been setting camp with his followers, creating fires, right? They had been, they had been with one another, okay? They had known about one another, and Jesus not only was in that realm with them, but he was fulfilling specific prophecies years before he even entered the scene. I mean, he had been confirming the fact time after time again that he was the Messiah. He was the Messiah, I'm not talking about 20 years or 30, 40, 50, 60 years. I'm talking about over 500 years of prophecies that were said about Jesus, specific prophecies being uh, taking place in specific times in fulfillment. And it's like, that's what the angel even said. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. He said he was going to go away. He said he was going to be dead for three days. He said that this was going to happen. It had to happen. And yet the disciples and the followers were weeping and they're looking for life in a tomb where dead people are stored. Now, that, this is a self-examination question right here. This isn't just a question for me. It's a question for everybody. It's the same question that was posed to them back in the day. Why? Why are you looking? Why? Since he told you all this in Galilee and all throughout his ministry, why are you looking in this tomb for something that's alive? That's the same exact question I pose to you today, you watching at home. This is a self-examination question for me as well. Why, if Jesus is the only one who promised us life, do we tend to look towards empty or limited places? Instead of looking for life in a tomb, we should be looking for life in Jesus. Amen? And we should seek him with all of our hearts. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Everybody say with all your heart. With all of your heart. You know if I went into marriage with half my heart, it wouldn't end up good? It'd be really, really bad, I'm telling you. I, I do it with all my heart, and it's still it's got some issues. You know what I mean? We've got to go in this way. This is a hard issue. This is a hard issue. We, th- this is a hard thing. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. He gave us his entire life. Now we give him our whole heart. Amen? Now, for the second point, seek ultimate fulfillment. Now, I love breakfast. I'm a breakfast guy. Any breakfast people in here? Breakfast? There's a lot of you. That's good. Uh, Some people don't really like breakfast. I love breakfast, okay? I mean, I'm talking like, I mean, I don't have a good breakfast every day. Uh, Maybe, like, sometimes I'm in a rush. I just need, like, like some cereal or something. Maybe, like, a quick cereal bar or something. But I really like a nice, you know, some eggs, bacon, you know, maybe some cream chip beef. Who knows? Maybe all those together. Who knows? 
Maybe a Belgian waffle. The Belgian waffle would be an item on itself, not together. But you know what I mean? I love a really, really good breakfast. And I also like, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I like some bread. I'm, I'm really a big bread guy. I like sandwiches. I mean, when my brother and I, we're really weird. We used to put chips in our sandwiches, multiple cheeses, different meats, and then we just squish it together, man. We love sandwiches. We're a sandwich family. I love me some bread. Any bread people in here? That's my weakness, okay? You know how people eat out after church service? You guys are going to spend a lot more today, I'm telling you, because of me. So um, one of my favorite types of breads is a concha. Does anybody know what concha is? Well, conchas are good. The concha, one person, hallelujah. Um, conchas are good. I mean, they're, they're really good. Um, I'm going to kind of hold it up here. It's, it looks like this. Now, a concha is Spanish for seashell, because it kind of looks, do you kind of see it? It kind of looks like a seashell, right? That's why they name it concha, because it looks like a seashell. And this is so delicious. I mean, I have an emotional attachment to it because of the fact that uh, when we used to go to church, my dad, sometimes before the service or after, he would, there was a little Mexican store on the side, and he would buy us these conchas. And so when I look at a concha, or I see it, it takes me to that place. It takes me to this place where I remember my dad, my dad buying this concha for me. And it's just, I mean, they come in all different shapes and sizes, different colors. And I mean, <laughs> oh my God. I'll get a vacuum. It is so good. I'm telling you. I mean, I forgot how messy they were. <laughs> I should have practiced the bite. <laughs> Listen, this is a delicious piece of bread. You guys should, no, nah, it's, it's germs, never mind. This is a good piece of bread, it really is. And food in general is really good, isn't it? It really is. Food is really good. It's delicious. It nourishes us. Food energizes us. Food fulfills us. But as good as food is, as good as this thing is, I'll still need another one in a month. As good as food really is, I will, it will never truly satisfy or fulfill us, right? I mean, any, any Disney people here in the house as well? I'm a big Disney guy. Come on now. Come on now. Settle down. Settle down. And anyway, so Colleen and I love Disney. We go to Disney a lot, and, and usually we drive, and, and usually with the radio off. But if you know my wife, it's fine because she keeps me entertained. We talk a lot. You know what I mean? So we, you should see it. If you've been to Disney in the past five years you know that they're really app friendly. Like you gotta use the app. You have to use the Disney Experience app. And you can actually schedule your food months before you even go to the restaurant. You can schedule your, Colleen and I can schedule the place we stay 11 months before we even show up. I mean, we're like, okay, baby, let's sit down. We literally got to take time out to, all right, where are we going to go on the first day? We're going to go, no, we went there last time. Let's go to this place. We set this place at this time, at this resort, this specific meal. And as good as that food really is, and it's really good. You pay a premium. It's good food. It's really good food, good service. They've got sometimes the characters come and they dance and all that, and it's awesome, good picture quality stuff. As good as the food at Disney is, I've never eaten a meal at Disney and then said, babe, that, that food was so good, I don't think I'll ever eat again. I don't think I'll ever need a meal again. No, what, on the contrary, after breakfast, you know what I do? I'm like, babe, that was so good. What's scheduled for lunch? <laughs> no, I'm not committing gluttony or anything. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm like, I'm already thinking about lunch. I'm like, these places are so good. I mean, they got so many great experiences. It's like, that was really good, but what time do we gotta be at lunch? What time do we gotta be at dinner, right? As good as food is, it, it can never give us fulfillment, ultimate fulfillment. Perhaps there's not a better verse than John chapter six, verse 27. It says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. If we skip to verse 33, it says, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us this bread. Always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Amen. Praise God and hallelujah for that. 
Amen. That's one of my favorite verses. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to him will never go hungry. Whoever believes in him will never be thirsty. Unlike this bread, unlike the food at Disney, think of your favorite restaurant. Unlike that restaurant, Jesus has lasting effects. Amen? Amen. He has effects that last forever. Amen? Guard your hearts. Fix your eyes in Christ alone, on Christ alone. The news, social media, trending topics, sports, vacations. Again, all of these things, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not necessarily even against any of these things. But all these things can sometimes exist for the purpose of making a lot of noise, a lot of distraction. Then because of these things, because of our focus on these things, we can sometimes make decisions we wouldn't have otherwise made had we fixed our eyes on the one who can ultimately fulfill us. Amen? In Christ alone. He is the only one capable of giving us life and ultimate fulfillment. Don't focus on the conscious. Don't focus on the materialistic things. Don't focus on the things that we have been conditioned and taught to think about and to value. Don't be that type of people. Philippians 3.19 says their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Their God is their stomach. That means that they're, anything that satisfies them, that's their God. You know, they've elevated it to a point of supremacy. They've elevated it to this point that this is the end all be all. This is my reason. That's one of the biggest questions in life, isn't it? What's my reason for life? I mean, if you go on Google, that's one of the first questions. Comes, what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning, right? Don't focus on the things that please your earthly desires. Don't focus, don't make your God your stomach because at the end, the glory is in your shame. Your mind should not be set on earthly things that are perishable. These things will perish eventually. Work, marriage, home life, parties, friendships, cars, hobbies. Again, these are things that are perishable. So we should never ever look to these things to give our life complete meaning or ultimate satisfaction or fulfillment. And now, and you'll, you'll need another house. If you elevate your house or your wife or anything else to this point of supremacy, you will need another one of those things. You fill it and ask the Lord to reveal it to you what it is that you have elevated to that point. I did, and he revealed it to me what it was. It's different. It could be different for everybody, but there's something there. Ask the Lord to reveal it to you. Ask, and you shall receive. Amen? Seeking life plus seeking ultimate fulfillment leads me to my last and final point, point number three, which is seek Jesus. In order to seek, in order to find life and obtain ultimate fulfillment, we must believe, we must live, we must trust in Christ alone. Now I challenge you to seek a relationship with God through the reading of his word, through uh, speaking with him in prayer. I mean, so it doesn't always have to be on your knees and, and doesn't always have to be in a secluded spot. Some of my best times talking to God are in my car. They really are. I mean, sometimes I drive hours to where I need to be and sometimes that is a great time to turn off the radio. Just turn it off and, and just talk to God. Just talk to God. And, and it doesn't have to be, you know, our Father who art in heaven and all that. Talk to him. Talk to him. Tell him what you're afraid of. Tell him the things you're nervous about. Tell him the things you're anxious about. Tell him, the, tell him what burdens you. Leave that at the foot of the cross. Tell that to Jesus. And that is how you seek a relationship with him. That's how you begin to grow. And through congregating with like-minded people. And do it with all of your heart. Avoid building your own kingdom. Avoid living for yourself. This, like I said earlier, is a challenge. Because we have all been conditioned, we have all been taught that this is important, what we do here. This right here. You know, like your, your, your retirement. Oh, I got I to do A, B, C so I can retire at this age. I, I got to do this and that so, so this will be in place. I, I, have to, I have to save X amount of money so then I can do this. I'm not knocking any of these things. These are great things. I'm not knocking them. But this is hard. This is hard. Avoid building our own kingdom and avoid living for ourselves is hard. I remember when I went to high school, I was a freshman. 
the first thing they were, they were doing, they, they had someone from a particular college and they're like, would you consider us in four years? Would you consider going to our college? I'm not knocking college. I'm not against college. But it's like, I, I'm not ready for that. We have been taught from a young age and conditioned, this is what matters. Start building your own kingdom. Start, do, start saving this, start doing this, and, and, and your life will be okay. Your fulfillment is found in these things. Avoid that. Avoid that. Jeremiah 2.13 says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and then two, they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Only Jesus can hold the water. Only Jesus has the ability to give you life. Abundantly. Abundant life. If you're hungry, seek Jesus. If you're thirsty, seek Jesus. If you're addicted, seek Jesus. If you're weary, seek Jesus. If you've prayed and received, seek Jesus. If you've prayed and not yet received, seek Jesus. If you got a six-figure job, praise God and seek Jesus. If you're unemployed, seek Jesus. If you need a miracle, seek Jesus. He is the only one that can fulfill you. I said earlier that I was going to talk about the gospel and preach the gospel to you. The gospel in the Greek is euangelion. Euangelion means good news. And for there to be good news, there has to be bad news. I'm sorry to tell you that. I know you probably came to get encouraged, but it's coming, I promise. You know, in sales, when you present a business proposal in front of someone, numbers, sometimes you say, I got good news and I got bad news. 99% of the time, the people want the bad news first. That what's the bad news? Get it out of the way. Just tell me the bad news. And you say the bad news, then you say the good news. The gospel is good news. There has to be bad news. Can I tell you the bad news? And this is really hard to hear. The bad news is, like the song we were singing, I'm not enough. The bad news is, you are not enough. I know that's counterculture and it's hard because we literally hear from pastors, preachers, and read books saying that you in your own right are enough. There's even movements and, and movements that, that are saying that in you, there is some sort of power outside from God that is enough. I'm here to tell you that is not what the Bible says. That is not what God's word says. There is bad news. This is horrible news. The worst news you could ever, ever receive. That outside from Christ, we will perish. The bad news is that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Me, you, everybody, you watching at home, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. But there is good news, amen? The good news is that Jesus came. The good news is that Jesus came to bridge the divide. That is the good news. That is the power of the gospel. That's the power of the Holy Spirit that comes and he's working in you right now. He is working in all of us. Only he has the ability to give us that. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it in full. Not half life. He came to give us full life. All of it. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that. That is what the Lord has placed on my heart today to tell you, to tell you watching at home that life and fulfillment can only come from him. And I'm only scratching the surface here. If you really want a good book to read, the book of Colossians really talks about the supremacy of Christ. I encourage you to read the book. It is so quick to, you can read it in one sitting. It's so quick. I encourage you to dig deeper in that book. But I'd like to pray for you this morning. I'd like to pray for you watching at home and watching at Middletown. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace, Lord, and your mercy, which is new every single morning. Lord, thank you for your grace, unmerited grace, Lord. We don't deserve it. Lord, we have not earned it. But for your love for us, we receive it, Lord, through Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray for every ear that has heard today, Lord. And that is not anything I've said, but by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I thank you that there are people in here that came with ears closed and you have opened them. I thank you that there were hearts that were closed and you have opened them today because of the power of your Holy Spirit. Not by anything I've said, not by any of the songs, not by any, the power of your Holy Spirit. 
That's what truly saves us. And right now, maybe you are here. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're listening online. Maybe you're at Middletown and you know that you have put things in place of God. You know that you've put your wife or your husband at that place where Jesus should be. Your job, maybe it's, I don't know what it is. Again, you have to ask the Lord what it is. Maybe that is you. Maybe you've never even experienced life at all. And you now understand that life can only be found and and experienced in Christ alone. If that is you today, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm going to say a prayer. You can recite it out loud. You can say it in your heart. It's not the verbiage that matters, but it's the cry of your heart. When I was younger, I used to say this prayer many times because I thought the prayer is what was important, the verbiage. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit that draws people unto him. And you can repeat this prayer if you want, if that's you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I don't quite understand it just yet. But I know that you hold the life. I know that all these things that I have put before you are perishable things. But Lord, today I submit myself to you. And Lord, I won't be perfect. But I now understand that you hold the life. Thank you for opening my eyes. Thank you for opening my heart. And I ask that you would help me on this journey, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Thank you.